The years that make up our childhood arguably impact us in irreversible ways. We take in everything about our surroundings, to the point of imitating things that inspire us and crafting lofty goals that we might never hope to achieve. These innocent times are memorable for so many reasons, shaping us into the people we become in our adult years. It's easy to reminisce about the best parts, but eventually we start to recall other aspects as well. That time we studied hard for a test, only to realize that we memorized the wrong material. That day we confessed to someone, leading to a rejection that still haunts us a bit. That year we wanted an award for discovering a star, later dropping the idea when our career as an astronomer didn't pan out. Growing up is full of all kinds of experiences, and more often than not, our parents are there with us along the way. They can be cornerstones of our young life, but that also depends on the kind of people they are. In some cases, you can feel more alone having parents than you can without. Maybe that time we were unable to study was because mom and dad were fighting downstairs again. Maybe after we got rejected, we wanted someone to talk to, but just couldn't find the right person to do that with. Maybe after we discovered that star, we realized how childish it was to expect something to come from it. Sometimes our surroundings give us a little too much to take in. Looking for answers in the wrong places, we may just find ourselves becoming someone we didn't expect to be. Despite our own desires and wishes, can our parents and home life really influence us to such a degree? Welcome back to Goodnight Pun Pun. Goodnight Pun Pun, or Oyasumi Pun Pun if you prefer, is a bit of an irregular manga series. While it does have one foot in the slice of life genre, the other foot is firmly planted in the psychological realm. Following our cartoon bird main character, we watch his life unfold over many years. From curious kid, to angsty teen, to depressed adult. Everything is out in the open for us to see. Previously, I talked about the various aspects that make up the series in general, including just how dark things can get. If you aren't new to the manga, you know exactly what plays out here. This time around, I'd like to go all the way back to the beginning. The first chapter shows our young 11-year-old protagonist going to school for the day. He has a nice group of friends he hangs out with, as well as a fun homeroom teacher, and other responsible adults are watching over the kids. The new transfer student he likes even likes him back. Pun Pun sure is a lucky guy. Coming home, he relaxes by watching some baseball with his dad. Being the nice parent he is, he gives Pun Pun a telescope as a present that night. Looking out to the stars beyond, the two have a nice bonding moment together. Pun Pun even manages to summon God to talk for a bit. Did you know he has the answers to everything? Just say a special phrase and he'll appear. Having finished his homework the night before, Pun Pun wakes up ready to start the day. It turns out a robber snuck into their house, giving our young hero the day off. What luck! Pun Pun's mom wasn't feeling well, so he got to spend some time with his cool uncle while she recovers in the hospital. Pun Pun's dad is on a business trip, so he continues to work hard at his studies in the meantime. His mom and dad finally come back, reuniting the family once again. Unbeknownst to Pun Pun, something amazing happened. His dad got a job with NASA! It's sad to see him go, but he's an adult now, so he'll be strong and wish his dad well. Pun Pun's uncle gets a girlfriend, and they all live together in the house as a loving family. Entering high school, Pun Pun enjoys his time in the new class. He's concerned about a few things, but his mom is always willing to talk. She passes away a little later, shaking Pun Pun to his core, but he'll always have the nice memories of their time together. Moving into his adult life is a challenge, but he's still close with his remaining family. He's looking forward to the opportunities that await him in the city. Everything is going to be just fine. While the uninformed might think these events sound normal, a majority will know how noticeably off they are. Things are just a little too clean. This is more or less a list of events that take place in Pun Pun's childhood, but it's ultimately incomplete. It's only when the missing parts are inserted, that we see how skewed this fantasy actually is. Going back to Pun Pun's initial school day, we're presented with a slightly different picture. Things do start off in a similar fashion, but as the next day rolls around, the first change becomes apparent. 
The teacher senses the possibility that Pun Pun didn't do his homework from the night before. Thankfully, he takes this news in stride by yelling at the kids. His simplistic face gets contorted into an uglier shape. Everyone is dumbfounded at the sight of their teacher losing his mind over the homework. This strange display continues for a while, until one of the students mentions that Pun Pun actually did complete his homework. By the next panel, he's back to normal, complete with a silly pose as he writes what just happened off as a joke. Immediately after, we see the stoic figures of the principal and vice principal standing in an office. The principal gets the other gentleman's attention, posing a game of hide and seek to him. The vice principal's face stretches to an obscene degree, with his superior following suit. Both strange expressions are gone by the next panel as the two continue their conversation. A few other adults add threats of violence into the mix. One tells Pun Pun she'll put him in a headlock for not paying attention, and the homeroom teacher casually talks about breaking someone's neck. While these depictions of the adults can be taken literally, I think there are two ways to interpret what's actually going on. One possibility is that we're seeing the adults from the kid's perspective. When we're young, older people can be very intimidating, and our imagination can definitely get the better of us. A simple phrase or interaction may come across as something completely different, and a child can lack the understanding to process things properly. Some of the overreactions from certain faculty members make sense in this light. The other possibility to consider is directly related to Asano himself. This could very well be the artist poking fun at society in a cynical way. A lot of adults in this series are drawn in unflattering forms, with lots of crude lines, folds, and facial features. Contrasting this, all drawings of children have much simpler features. There are various older characters that are highly caricatured, with some becoming quite agitated or unstable. Outside of a few examples, these portrayals tend to go unnoticed for the most part. When the teacher has his breakdown over the missing homework, the kids aren't alarmed and things go back to normal soon after. Likewise, when the principal appears with his screeching face, he disappears briefly, then reappears like normal. He inquires about something happening in the halls, and the other teacher replies with an average response. The former aggressive remarks are ignored as well. Asano could simply be showing his own playful views on what he thinks the adults look like on the inside, including what they actually want to say. Either way, this remains open to interpretation. Despite all of this, a lot of older characters are still written as being useless or unreliable. Early on, we actually see a decent amount of these people through the eyes of one of Pun Pun's friends. A mere 11 chapters in, we see Seki talking with his dad. A smart and sensible kid is forced to deal with the situation his alcoholic father landed himself in. It's most likely due to this that Seki's cynical streak starts so early. Later in his life, a teacher attempts to talk with him about his lack of attendance and dropping grades. Seki has his own opinions on the matter, quickly wearing down the uncaring educator. He makes one last attempt, mentioning a parent-teacher conference, but Seki mentions the fact that his dad is a drunk, so he probably won't make it. The teacher gives up, simply telling him to leave. Even further into the chapters, Seki comes across a woman that has an interesting job for him to complete. Her fiancé suddenly called off their engagement, leaving her behind to run off with another woman. Claiming that she isn't planning on living a long life, she simply requests for Seki to kill her ex. After a lot of internal monologuing and plenty of debate, he decides against committing the murder. Returning with the news of being unable to go through with the killing, the woman is surprisingly relieved. It turns out that she changed her mind right after Seki left the restaurant. She attempted to call him, but he was too focused on the task to pick up. Seki tries to leave her with some decent life advice, but it quickly gets thrown in his face, along with a glass of water. The woman coldly looks down on him while offering some choice words of her own. Regardless of the fact that he can relate to her, he still sees where she's coming from. Between all of these side characters, Seki is met with either indifference or selfishness. Seki's dad isn't willing to try anymore, instead opting out for drinking the days away. The guidance instructor hardly wants to put in the effort to change Seki's mind, so he simply writes him off. The random woman pushes a remarkably problematic job on Seki's lap, then irresponsibly goes back on it mere moments later. If it was anyone else with worse circumstances, odds are her ex would have met a gruesome fate by her hand. With the amount of thinking the younger main characters do, it's no wonder the adults come across so poorly in comparison. 
Then again, maybe that's something else that's implied here. After your younger years are over, are you doomed to just become a useless adult? Before drawing any conclusions, we might want to observe another group of characters first. These two are far more prominent in the overall story, arguably being some of the worst cases of unreliable adults. Once again, let's head back a bit to introduce ourselves to the parents of Pun Pun. After finishing up the school day, we again find ourselves back at Pun Pun's house. While he thinks about becoming a baseball player in the future, his dad makes a request for beer. When he's denied this, he responds back calmly by yelling out obscenities. The two parents start fighting amongst themselves over the trivial matter, and Pun Pun watches things escalate on the sidelines. Some readers may be worried about our young hero's well-being, but there's no cause for concern. After all, Pun Pun was somewhat used to this. Moving upstairs for the moment, Pun Pun talks to God for a little bit. He asks the all-knowing deity if his parents will ever get along again, and God decides to brush the question off with disinterest. Pun Pun's dad enters the room, looking slightly more disheveled since we last saw him. He brings out a telescope to give to his young son as a present, though we see him verbally slip as to where he got the item. He offers some manly words to Pun Pun, and soon after, everyone heads to bed for the night. Waking up the next morning, Pun Pun heads downstairs to start his day. He's met with a strange sight, as the surrounding area is completely trashed. Not only that, but his mom is lying unconscious on the floor. His dad mentions how a robber snuck into the house, pressing Pun Pun to believe that he's telling the truth. Without ever realizing it, this is the moment that will forever change Pun Pun's life. Things are quite a bit different here than what was initially presented. In setting up this contrast, you can see just how irregular the events actually are. It's from this point that the paths will diverge a bit, as both parents go their own separate ways from here. While it takes a bit of time before they become more prominent, Pun Pun's uncle is the main adult figure in his life. I'll be keeping discussion on him lighter, however, because he deserves his own full-length discussion. Regardless, the first person we'll focus on is Pun Pun's dad, also known as Mr. Punyama. Obviously being the aggressor in the domestic dispute, he spent some time in jail, being released about two months later. He runs into Pun Pun soon after the initial desertion of his crush, Aiko. Finding him crying while walking home, they stop in a nearby park to talk about things, with Pun Pun's dad attempting to comfort him as best he can. His son tells him about a new star he discovered with a telescope, and when he asks if Pun Pun will take him there someday, he says of course, causing him to break down crying out of happiness. He tells his son that it's time for him to go, dropping the line about being hired by NASA and heading off to America. Asking his dad when they'll be able to meet again, Pun Pun is met with a flimsy response of any time at all. His father concludes the encounter by telling his son that he loves him, but Pun Pun doesn't offer any additional words. He simply looks at him for a bit, then turns and makes his way back home. This is the last time for a while that Pun Pun sees his dad, and it isn't until he's just about done with high school that the former parent makes another appearance. After the death of his mother, Pun Pun is greeted by someone he hasn't thought about in a very long time, outside of the occasional letters his father sent to keep in touch. Not quite knowing what to say to his son after all these years, Mr. Punyama engages in some light banter. He continues to talk about various random things, avoiding the heavy topic that's on everyone's mind. It's during this constant chatter that Pun Pun realizes something. He's really not in the mood for any of this. It isn't the fact that he was more or less neglected by his father all this time. He's the same guy he always was, so Pun Pun racks his brain for the exact reason he feels the way he does. Watching his dad for a while, he finally understands what changed. Himself. After dancing around things for a little while longer, Mr. Punyama finally asks his son the question he'd been building up to this entire time. He asks Pun Pun if he'd like to move with him to another city, effectively starting things over for the both of them. They used to get along before, so he thinks it might be a good idea. Pun Pun is noticeably confused by this, wondering exactly what it is his dad is expecting from this encounter. In the end, he just can't take the offer seriously, remarking how he'd rather live alone. Mr. Ponyama accepts this in stride, deciding to head out soon after. He continues to awkwardly stumble through his words, but leaves with one last statement. Pun Pun is told that no matter how old he gets, the man before him will always be his father. 
quietly leaving, we see a faint trace of tears in the former parent's eyes. On the outside of the door, a loud slam can be heard. A conflicted teenager is left on the other side to grapple with the emotions clashing inside himself. Late into the story, a friend of Pun Pun's goes to visit Mr. Punyama in order to learn more about his son. He isn't shy when it comes to talking about this topic, recalling how he used to act and complimenting him on various things. He also notes how there's no way he would ever come to visit, as they haven't spoken since the passing of his mother. He later regrets how he wasn't able to teach Pun Pun an important lesson about life. Being a bit selfish and irresponsible is a necessity in order to find happiness, and he continues to regret not telling him even now. While I do agree with this to an extent, it's interesting to see him say this, because this mindset effectively worked against him. Back when Pun Pun was still a kid, he could have taken steps to keep in touch with them more. Instead, he lies about an overseas job and tells his son they can meet whenever he wants. Things get worse when you take into account that the letters Pun Pun received from his dad were actually written by his mom. She did this in order to help cheer him up a bit, but eventually, it ends up having the opposite effect. He finds out the truth behind the letters right before his dad visits. It's because of this that he can't take his dad's offer to move seriously. Maybe if they had actually spent time together before all this, things could have turned out differently. Unfortunately, Mr. Panyama stuck a little too closely to his own advice. He lived a selfish life away from his son, leading to an irresponsible meetup years after it was too late to reconnect properly. It's also worth noting that he tells his divorced friends how he's happiest at that point in his life. With only loose attachments to speak of, familial commitment might not be the best thing for him. Pun Pun's life experiences up to this point left no room for an unreliable adult to come back. Back at our original divergence point, we'll now focus on Pun Pun's mom, also known as Miss Onodera. Despite being around Pun Pun for most of his adolescence, she has an almost complete lack of presence in his life. Immediately after the assault, his mother gets checked into the hospital. Pun Pun and his uncle come to visit her, but no one shares any words with each other. The two leave, and we find out that Pun Pun isn't exactly the biggest fan of his mom. Apparently, she doesn't really talk with him, preferring to get on him about doing his chores, among other things. Later, we see her getting ready to leave the hospital. One of the nurses mentions how her son will probably be happy to see her home again, prompting a rather cold response. Soon after, the same nurse is wondering where she got off to, and we're left with an ominous shot of the mother's abandoned articles. Her jump is reported to Pun Pun's uncle, and the two of them hail a cab and rush back to the hospital. Uncle has some choice words for her upon arriving, but they get written off as his sister jokes about the incident. Being discharged soon after, Mom comes back home wondering where Pun Pun is. She attempts to get some words out of him, finding none from her distracted son. Getting annoyed, she keeps trying for a reaction, only serving to make things worse. Agitated now, she complains to her brother about the way Pun Pun is acting, something he doesn't quite get either. What neither adult understood was that Pun Pun couldn't be hurting any more severely at this very moment. This was right after Pun Pun was forced to miss his important meetup with Aiko. His uncle got the call that his mom fell right as he was about to head out. Racked with guilt, he buries himself into a cushion at the hospital. At home, he has no one he can talk to about his sadness. He stares up at his mother with tears in his eyes, ready to burst at any moment. Is he mad at the timing? Is he sad no one is there for him? We don't know for sure, and neither does his mom. She can't relate to him, and because she doesn't know how to speak with her son, nothing gets resolved. Sad to say, this doesn't change as we move forward in the story. As Pun Pun's personal problems continue, relations with his mother don't get any better. Pun Pun's mom starts to drink more frequently, something that Mr. Panyama was chastised for previously. Pun Pun takes his high school entrance exams, which mom completely spaces. As the ignorance piles up, it starts to come to a head on the way back from checking on another family member. Thinking about other things, Pun Pun's mom again starts to get agitated with him. Being told that she's the only family he's got left now leaves him with a remarkably sour expression. She finally snaps at him, demanding he say what's on his mind. This shakes him, bringing another wave of anger out of her. Finally settling down, she tells him not to come home until morning, while she has a friend over. While this married friend of hers helps to briefly ease her sorrows, 
Pun Pun wanders alone along the night streets. Left to his own devices and craving attention, dark urges begin to surface. Back at home, his mother starts to get a little too worked up, resulting in her body shutting down on her. She's taken to the hospital, where she learns an operation will be necessary to keep her healthy. Pun Pun learns about this and visits soon after, but his mom insists that he continue to focus on his studies, pissing him off. Loneliness starts to eat away at her, leading to thoughts of a family she doesn't have anymore. Misono Dera later meets a teen boy who's troubled by his own problems. Getting his girlfriend involved in a bike accident, he isn't sure how to approach the situation. Telling him that the present is what's most important, Miss Onodera insists that a few simple things are all his girlfriend needs to hear from him. She later confesses that she wanted to hear those very things herself from her ex-husband. When asked if she ever said them to her son, she admits that she hasn't. Even if they know how the other is feeling, their own stubbornness won't allow them to give in and make up with each other. It's in this way that Miss Onodera is convinced that she'll always be lonely. As the days continue on, Pun Pun's mother finally has her operation. Waking up, she talks about the nice family dream she had, looking forward to coming back home. Seeing Pun Pun in the living room, she greets him and starts to make small talk. Getting out of the hospital has left her in a slightly more positive mood, ready to start things off on the right foot. Unfortunately for her, Pun Pun still doesn't have anything to say to his mom. He indifferently moves to another room, his mother's shouts falling dead at his back. Dealing with his own problems, his mom's time in the hospital doesn't even register. Despite wanting to try and make things better, at this point, it would amount to nothing more than playing pretend. Two years later, Pun Pun's mother is out of time, having developed cancer. She apologizes to Pun Pun, saying how she really did love him in the end. Sadly, Pun Pun can't bring himself to feel the same. While Miss Onodera was certainly around Pun Pun more than his father, her impact may very well have been smaller. She wasn't focused on being a parent because more than anything, she valued her freedom over everything else. During her last few chapters, we witness various parts of her life, including her student days. One of her friends thinks she'll do some amazing things, but also makes the interesting statement that this might only be possible if she has a clear objective. This is the central point of everything in her life. She never ends up finding a goal to pursue, leaving her to wander from place to place looking for something. She makes a note of this while talking to the teen at the hospital. Never attempting to truly find herself, she instead waited for someone else to find her. Not being successful in that, she continued to run away from reality, unable to really settle down anywhere. This only leaves her craving freedom, and when she can't have it, she becomes self-destructive. Not needed by anyone, and not engaging in anything, the only option left is going through the motions. Instead of constantly searching, things may have been better if she turned around to appreciate what she already had. It could have been just what she was looking for. With all of that said, where does this leave Pun Pun? His mom says an interesting line at the hospital about how Pun Pun resembles his parents too much. He inherited all of their bad points, and we do see this throughout the series. The selfishness and irresponsibility of his father manifests itself in some very bad ways at various points in Pun Pun's life. Likewise, his mother's neglect as she desired freedom ended up rubbing off on him. This results in him gaining his own sense of freedom, at the cost of being a cold person who can never truly trust anyone. We can also add a sense of stubbornness to the mix, especially when it comes to being dedicated to a certain girl throughout his life. Given everything we see in this story, I'm reminded of a certain line from another Asano work, known as Solonin. In the first chapter, the main character remarks how adults are just people who go whatever to everything. My kid might be having a hard time, but as long as I'm happy, whatever. My son and I don't get along, but whatever. This one night stand might ruin my life, but whatever. Kind of interesting just how well that ties in. One last thing I'd like to talk about involves something else we see at the very start of the series. After his dad gives him the telescope, Pun Pun immediately becomes interested in studying outer space. He finds what appears to be a new moving star, immediately thinking about winning a Nobel Prize. This escalates into using the prize money to build a house on the star, buy lots of trivial things, and even make a star house for his parents. 
As an innocent fantasy, it's perfectly acceptable for a child to dream about. This idea gets put on the back burner for a while, as Pun Pun continues to grow up and deal with a variety of issues. While his parents living together on a star initially seems viable, this gets shattered after his dad leaves, followed by divorce proceedings soon after. Looking at the sky for the first time in a while, Pun Pun remarks how his star has already disappeared. The place representing his perfect family life and future is no more. Pun Pun has now grown tired of being treated like a kid. The light panels we see him talk through early on eventually give way to more detached dark panels. The adults around him aren't helpful in the slightest, and as the days continue on, Pun Pun feels himself growing blacker. As more time passes, Pun Pun takes a moment and thinks about his younger days when he wanted to seriously study space. He remarks on how much of a kid he was, and looking at the night sky now, it couldn't look further away. The makeshift family continues on, not amusing Pun Pun in the slightest. Alone in his room, he starts to think about his current situation. In the format of a radio show question, he lists off the rather bleak aspects of his life. Posing the question of how he should live to no one in particular, God takes the opportunity to butt in and slam Pun Pun's expectations to the ground. He doesn't have the strength to argue back, and it's at this point that we see the last of Pun Pun's original hopes come crashing down. Despite this, Pun Pun doesn't give in to his surroundings. Even if today was tough, maybe tomorrow will be better. If not tomorrow, then next week. If not next week, then next month. If not next month, then next year. Happy times are sure to come again. That's what he wants to believe. In any case, that's all for today. Good night, Pun Pun. Hey there. If you made it to the end, thank you very much for watching. This has been another personal interpretation of certain aspects in the series, and I hope it was enjoyable to listen to. If the story seems like something you'd be interested in, consider checking it out or buying the books to support the author. Hope you have a great day, and I'll see you next time. Peace, peace, guys.